This presentation is on the market revolution. That's a term that many historians use uh, to refer to a whole series of economic changes uh, and social changes that happen in the first half or so of the 19th century, certainly uh, before the Civil War. Um, later on, there will be something called the Industrial Revolution. That's when you get large factories and heavy industry uh, and, you know, steel mills, for example. Uh, uh, later on, uh, automobile manufacturing. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, we're talking about some economic changes that had to come before that major industrial uh, revolution took place. Um, the, the definition of a market revolution, I think, is that uh, people are producing for a large area, not just a local area. Uh, and that means they have to be able to transport their goods uh, to a wide area. Uh, in agriculture, it's the transition from subsistence, from just growing what you need for yourself, uh, to cash crops. Now, we know that in the colonial period, there were some important cash crops. I and mean, there was tobacco, there was rice, for example. Uh, but uh, the, the number of cash crops increases significantly during uh, the 19th century, during the market revolution. Uh, in manufacturing, what it means uh, is the transition from handcrafting things, making things by hand, to mass production. So instead of a shoemaker who makes uh, pairs of shoes one by one, you have a shoe factory that produces them in large quantities. Now, a lot, a lot of things have to happen in order to have a market revolution. They all have to work together. Uh, so let's take a look at those things. First of all, you need energy sources. Uh, first of all, water, as in uh, water mills, water powered looms, that sort of thing. Uh, and then later steam, which is water converted to uh, a more efficient and powerful energy source. Um, you need good transportation because it doesn't matter how much you can produce, if you can't get it to market, uh, then it's not going to do you any good. Uh, now, how does that happen? Well, steamships are one way. Uh, the first was invented in 1807. Uh, roads uh, in areas that aren't served by waterways. Water is still the faster way to travel, but in between, you need some good roads. Uh, canals, uh, filling in uh, areas where there are no rivers. Uh, and then finally, beginning in 1830, railroads. And that was the biggest news of all uh, on this list. Not only that, but you need better communication. And that's something that the country got too uh, in the decades following the American Revolution. In 1790, for example, the, the date of the first U.S. Census, there were only 75 post offices in the entire nation. Forty years later, by 1830, there were over 8,400 post offices. So you can see that the growth is explosive. Uh, as of 1844, the telegraph came on the scene, uh, a much more rapid way to communicate. Uh, and finally, more newspapers were published, many, many more. Uh, and all of these things worked together to create the possibility of a market revolution. You also need a banking system. Now, we've talked about that. We talked about the first bank of the United States from uh, 1791 to 1811, then the second bank of the United States from uh, uh, the second bank of the United States uh, from uh, 1816 to 1836. Uh, and then there was a time without a national bank, uh, and uh, the lack of a national bank cause problems. Uh, this, for example, uh, is uh, a banknote, a dollar bill, uh, printed by the Lee Bank in Massachusetts. Well, uh, if you don't have a central bank to control how much money is printed and to put some rhyme and reason into this system, uh, then that uh, creates problems. So uh, although the, the United States had the basic ingredients, uh, banking uh, was always an issue, and you had major swings in the economy 
they were called panics, where uh, you know people, uh, you know, were were terrified of what was going on in the economy, and they uh, they uh, sold stocks, for example, and they uh, you know didn't want to invest in anything. People lost their jobs. Uh, people lost investments. There were all sorts of problems. There was a major one in 1819, another major one in 1837, another in 1857, and so on, and a lot of smaller ones in between. Uh, we talked about the steamboat. Well, this is Robert Fulton's uh, first steamboat, uh, which he put together in 1807. Uh, a generation earlier, in 1776, uh, James Watt had developed the steam engine in uh, England. Uh, easy to remember because it's the same year as the Declaration of Independence. Uh, well, what Robert Fulton did, he uh, did this in uh, the New York area. He tested it out on the Hudson River. Uh, what he did was to adapt the steam engine and put one in uh, a boat, uh, and the result was the Claremont, a, a steamship. Uh, and it was lightning fast. It could travel 300 miles in 32 hours. That's almost 10 miles an hour, which in those days was lightning quick. Now another transportation advance was called the National Road. Um, Congress didn't authorize many projects like, projects like this, but it did uh, in 1806. It took a long time to build, but it went from Cumberland, Maryland to Vandalia, Illinois. And you'll notice there are terminals here on the Potomac River uh, and the Ohio River. Uh, and since those rivers don't connect, uh, they're separated by uh, the Appalachian Mountains, uh, it's uh, possible here with this road to uh, provide a link that uh, water transport transportation did not provide. Uh, these are some early roads. Uh, this is a corduroy road. I mean, think of like the fabric we call corduroy, and it's it has ribs like this. It's it's bad. Uh, when it rained, it got muddy, and this became a gigantic uh, quagmire. It was a mess. Now, plank roads were a little better, but not that much. You notice they laid planks here, and then they put uh, planks, uh, laid them on top, uh, so that you had a pretty reasonable road uh, until it started to rain and some of the planks began to sink into the mud. And then plank roads were not uh, so good either. Now, uh, probably more important than these roads are canals. Uh, now, the most famous of them was the Erie Canal. I'll trace it here with a pointer. Uh, it goes from uh, the Hudson River which flows south to New York City and into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and uh, it, it goes from, from the Hudson River. It goes westward uh, through upstate New York. I'm following the route of the Erie Canal now, and it winds up in Lake Erie. Uh, of course, up here is Niagara Falls, so it, it, it has to bypass that. Uh, so you wind up in Lake Erie. And then from there, when you cross Lake Erie, uh, you can get to the the lower Great Lakes. You can get to Detroit, uh, for example, to uh, the Detroit River, to Lake uh, St. Clair, to the St. Clair River, to Lake Huron, to Lake Michigan. And um, this was a tremendous uh, spur to the population of Michigan. It was finished in, in 1825, and it was after that that Michigan began to gain population rapidly uh, and uh, became a state 12 years later in 1837. Uh, now, the Erie Canal actually cut transportation costs by 95%. Uh, in other words, the cost, for example, of uh, shipping a bushel of wheat uh, this whole distance was cut by 95% because doing it by road was incredibly uh, tedious and difficult. Uh, so. You know, the, the Erie Canal had a major effect, and you can see all sorts of offshoots that connected to the Erie Canal. Uh, and this is uh, another canal map. You get an idea of this network of canals that was built 
uh, in the northeastern United States. Uh, of course, there were problems with canals. Uh, one was they would freeze in winter. Uh, so you were limited as to when you could use them. Uh, another problem was uh, that if the land wasn't perfectly level, and it rarely was, uh, you needed to build locks uh, to raise and lower the water levels of the canal. Um, it, there were many, many locks built on these canals. So it wasn't an ideal situation, uh, but it was much better than uh, what they had before, which was not much. Of course, this would be more or less taken over by the railroads, which were the, the real solution. Uh, along canals, you had uh, towpaths along the side, and typically mules would pull these uh, canal boats. This is a, a very romanticized image of life on the Erie Canal. Uh, you can see that it looks absolutely wonderful. Uh, the reality was not always this attractive. Uh, now, the first railroad was the Baltimore and Ohio. It was only a few miles long at first. It was built in 1830. Uh, and here is the first uh, locomotive in the United States. This is only five years after the very first railroad was built in Britain. Um, now, by 1860, that's only 30 years, you have a whole network of railroads uh, all over the eastern United States. Although you'll notice there are more in the north than in the south. And uh, this fact became significant during the Civil War. The north had an advantage because of its better railroads. Uh, now for communication, you have uh, Samuel Morse, uh, who developed the telegraph. And uh, the, the first one was uh, constructed between Washington and Baltimore. It's a distance of Oh, 30 miles or so, roughly. Uh, and his first message was, what have God wrought? This, of course, spread uh, dramatically, rapidly, after he invented it. And, of course, it used uh, Morse code, a system of long and short, or dots and dashes, uh, that you put together to uh, form letters and then words. Uh, it's really a form of binary code. It's not that different from uh, computer code. It's, it's very primitive, but uh, that's essentially what it was. Um, it was very important to try to work more efficiently. Uh, the cotton gin, which we'll talk about in the next presentation, was very important for that. Uh, the uh, textile mill, a Slater textile mill, uh, made it, it much more efficient to process all that cotton that was being grown in the South. Uh, and interchangeable parts were very important because uh, it was much more efficient. You didn't have to handcraft parts to each individual item. Uh, the, uh, the plow, the steel plow, uh, made agriculture much more productive, uh, as did the McCormick Reaper, which was a, an, an amazing way of uh, harvesting wheat. Now this is just a summary here. Uh, we're going to look at each one of these. The cotton gin we'll deal with uh, in, in the next presentation, but let's look at Samuel Slater's textile mills. Uh, he uh, kind of secretly lifted uh, some of this technology from Britain, brought it to the United States, uh, and you have a, kind of an early version of a factory. You'll notice that uh, they made use of child labor. They made use of the labor of women. Uh, these workers were paid extremely low wages, uh, but they were able to uh, turn out large amounts of cloth, of textiles. Uh, primarily, they were powered by water. Now, to look into the textile industry a bit more, uh, the most important center of it was probably Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, a town north of Boston. Uh, and at first, the workers there were mainly women uh, or even girls uh, ages 16 to 25. Some were uh, even under 10. They did make use of, of child labor. And then uh, this was in the 1820s and 30s. Uh, by the 1840s, uh, a lot of this work was taken over by Irish immigrants, often entire families. 
working in the mills of Lowell, Massachusetts. They worked 13 to 14 hours a day. Uh, as I said, for very low wages, and some of them made $2 a week. Uh, very strict rules. They had to, the, the owners had to convince the uh, farm families that they could provide a safe and wholesome environment for their daughters, uh, or the, the, the fathers wouldn't let their daughters uh, go to Lowell. Uh, so they, they imposed very strict rules. They had, you know, uh, dormitories with uh, curfews and, you know, uh, meals together and uh, women overseeing uh, the living situation of young women who, who worked in the mills. Uh, and uh, because this was new, uh, women had never, especially coming from a farm, uh, had never had the opportunity to do this sort of work. For many of them, it was uh, a, a wonderful uh, eye-opening experience. They got to meet other uh, young women. They got to uh, produce a literary magazine, which we still have. Uh, on the other hand, they were horribly exploited for very, very long hours at very, very low wages. Uh, and they went on strike a couple of times in the 1830s. Um, you, can, uh, you can find out more about the uh, textile industry in Lowell at this uh, website. Um, this link on the audio commentary is not live, but the same uh, PowerPoint uh, in the PDF version uh, has uh, this link live, and you can follow it. Um, interchangeable parts made an enormous difference. Um, this is Eli Whitney, the same man who invented the cotton gin, was mainly a gun manufacturer. And what they had to do before the system of interchangeable parts uh, was to handcraft each gun and when a part broke and they needed a spare they would have to you know pound it out and and spend file it and work on fitting it to the gun so that it would work because guns are precision instruments uh, but if you could make the parts so precisely that you could just take them from a bin and put any any of these parts on any of the guns then that was an enormous improvement in efficiency and uh, lowering cost. Uh, and it, was, it allowed them to produce many, many more uh, since it wasn't just handwork anymore. Uh, it also involved what was called de-skilling. Uh, a, a skilled gun maker uh, could command a better salary because their skills were highly developed and they were in short supply, but they couldn't produce enormous quantities. Uh, De-skilling means you can take anybody almost and in an hour or so you can teach them one single job. If you break down the making of the gun uh, into a lot of little jobs, you can have a person for each one of those little jobs and then uh, that person's job is very simple. It's also very boring very repetitive, and the wages for that were very low. Uh, this is John Deere's uh, steel plow uh, that made a big difference in, in the efficiency of agriculture. And finally, the McCormick Reaper. Uh, this was uh, a device for harvesting wheat, uh, and it was mass produced in Chicago. Uh, now, when you plant wheat, wheat, once it ripens in the field, you have about a week to harvest it, and then it starts to spoil. So this meant that you could only plant as much as you knew you could harvest. Otherwise, you were just wasting the seed and wasting your time. Uh, but the reaper allowed farmers to plant a lot more wheat, um, and it vastly increased the number of acres that were planted. Uh, it produced, it increased productivity. In other words, how much one worker can do in one period of time fivefold, five times over. Uh, this is the kind of uh, advantage that you get uh, from a system like this. Uh, and to give you an idea of how much of a difference it made, uh, it allowed uh, the North to produce plenty of food and even export it to other countries during the Civil War uh, when you had to feed the army and so many of the farmers were away uh, fighting in the war. That's uh, what a tremendous uh, boost the McCormick Reaper provided. 